Hi, welcome everyone. Good to see such a strong audience again. Uh, today we have Palak Dalal from our research team. Uh, she tracks retail and some consumer sectors uh, in the research team. And today she's going to talk about the footwear industry. Uh, Palak, over to you. Sure. Um, all right. So today we'll take a look at the footwear sector. We'll step into the footwear industry. And um, I think I'll start with asking people um, whether they think of footwear as a utility product or as a fashion accessory, so form or function. And for those of you who haven't seen the movie Nike Air, uh, it's a scene from the movie where uh, Matt Damon is discussing the design and the functionality of the Air Jordans uh, while finalizing on the product. And in the movie, they do eventually choose form over function. And I think that is what uh, reflects the changing mindset of the consumer as well. So um, I think the consumer preferences have evolved over a period of time. And footwear isn't just a utility product anymore. So we'll just have a look, a quick look at the manufacturing process.
Uh, so that was just a snippet of uh, a longer video. And I just wanted to highlight some of the processes in terms of manufacturing a shoe. The entire link or uh, the original link is in the end of the presentation if anyone wants to watch it. Um, basically, over the last decade, there has been an increased uh, focus on PU or polyurethane footwear because of various reasons. It can be used for fashionable formal footwear as well. It's skid resistant, it's lightweight, it has high longevity. And typically the sole is made of either rubber or PU. So most of the raw material uh, currently is sourced locally. Of course, there is still some dependence on Korea and South Korea and China. And overall, it depends on what kind of shoe or what kind of footwear you are producing. But typically the sole consists of around 30 to 35% of the cost of the entire product. If we just take a look at the market size of the global footwear industry, um, the footwear retail market for US, Canada, and Mexico, so that's North and Central America, is around $73 billion. China alone is as big as the US. And um, Western Europe, if you see, is cumulatively around $46 billion. So India is currently still at around $9.6 billion, which translates to approximately 72,000 crores. So 90% of the footwear manufactured in India is consumed domestically. And uh, in terms of exports, US is one of the largest exporters, um, sorry, imports. US is one of the largest importers at around 20% and China being the largest exporter when has a share of around 60-65%. If we were to look at the Indian footwear industry, India is the second largest producer of footwear in the world. And... Um, the retail market, the entire Indian retail market is valued at around 59 uh, to around 60 lakh crores as an FY20. Uh, footwear, the footwear industry out of that constitutes to about 1-1.5% one, one of the total Indian retail market. And out of this, 70% of the footwear industry in our country is currently unorganized in nature. So even though there is a shift that can be seen from the unorganized to the organized sector, it's very gradual and it'll take um, a couple of years before we can see something meaningful. This is more of a graphical representation of the Indian footwear market. Uh, as you can see, it dipped in 2021 due to the pandemic. And uh, it's been about two years and it, I think we have uh, more than recovered. If one were to talk about the annual footwear consumption in terms of volumes, um, if you can see, China has the highest consumption at uh, 4,000 odd million pairs and India is next in line at around 2,600, which means globally India and China are the highest. But if one were to look at the consumption per capita, uh, India and China are the lowest. So India is just 1.9. So despite having the highest consumption, they have the lowest uh, per capita consumption. So that um, is an indication of the available headroom for the industry to grow. We'll take a quick look at BIS or Bureau of Indian Standards. So essentially it prescribes what kind of raw material, whether PVC, leather, rubber is to be used in the manufacturing of the footwear and there are certain norms on making soles and other parts. Um, it includes all kinds of shoes, so sports shoes, PVC, gumboots, everything. Uh, it has been currently enforced upon 24 categories within the industry and the aim is to align it with global standards in order to um, curb your substandard imports from China and keep a check on domestic production. So they've set up a couple of test facilities uh, for the same and, um, the, and they've also a couple of, uh, you know, uh, incentives in terms of testing for the smaller units. So um, what happens is that currently they have imposed the same standards for a pair of footwear that is probably a 100 or 150 rupee Hawaii chappal and a 1000 rupee premium segment flip flop. So this kind of leads us to the next point, which is closure of smaller units. So does this mean that the smaller unorganized players we may or may not be able to survive. So as per an article that I came across, 70% of the Indian footwear industry, which as we know is unorganized, and it employs around 44 lakh people. So um, 
the uh, the micro units especially have appealed to the government and uh, they are asking for an exemption for micro enterprises completely um in terms of deadlines the deadline uh, for so many of these has been delayed and extended to 1st jan 2024 for msmes and 1st july 2024 for micro enterprises it's overall not applicable to those who are not export houses or if they have revenues below 50 crores coming to the segmentation in terms of men women and kids um the men segment of course has around a higher share at around 52% the women is at around 38% and the balance is kids or children um the penetration of the organized retail is higher in the men's segment and the women's category is growing at a faster rate as there are multiple locations which demand a higher volumes so in if we look at some of the companies that are listed on the exchange metro is something that is more is a more female oriented brand and around 40% of revenues are from the women segment and 35% is from the men segment whereas if you look at say a company like campus it's tilted more towards the men segment and almost 80 85% of revenues are from it uh, bata is relatively evenly spread out it has around 35 40% from each segment relaxo again is skewed more towards the men segment so if one were to look at segmentation in terms of the type of product uh, you have casual sportswear formal etc so of course in india casual um constitutes the largest part of the buy at around 68 uh, 69% and uh, sportswear is at around 18 to 20% and uh, it's at a lower base but it's growing at a much faster rate as the increased demand for athleisure and uh, travel and fitness has increased the demand for sports and athleisure wear has of course also increased So speaking of sports and athleisure if we take a quick look at global sportswear and athleisure market uh of course US is the largest currently and has around 22% share followed by China which is around 14% share and India is very minuscule at around 1% share If we were to zoom in a little and take a look at the sports and athleisure market in India specifically um and out of say 16000 crores approximately 9000 is um made up of footwear and the balance would probably be a athleisure apparel so it india seems to be mirroring china and uh, it's growing at a very healthy rate if we were to briefly look at some of the key asian players uh so we have antani ning campus etc uh as you can see all of them a uh, deal in footwear but not necessarily in other segments like apparel and sports gear so anta is a player that deals in all categories and leaning and anta are core competitors in china and both have sizable market share uh anta is more diversified in terms of the price ranges as it's acquired fila and some other premium range brands whereas leaning has a more different management style in the sense that uh it's determined on bringing its own building its own brand so uh, despite probably being superior in terms of quality pricing as we can see um anta has not had the same kind of growth that leaning has had uh if one were to compare it to an indian footwear company leaning probably has more of a similar style than anta does if we look at the category in which each brand has their forte or niche um we can see that adidas a6 campus fila nike all of them are predominantly in the sports and athleisure segment other brands such as relaxo metro men metro are more prominent in the casual segment in terms of skus within the indian companies campus certainly has the highest skus amongst all indian players followed by bata probably moving on to the indian sector again if we were to look at the channel wise mix in india uh this is a very broad uh distinction but around 42 to 47% is from the ebo channel 
around 48 to 53 percent from the MBO channel and the LFS is the balance. Um, if one were to contrast it with the e-commerce market in the footwear industry, it's still relatively very nascent at around two to three, three and a half percent. Most players are either distribution led or wholesale led. Um, Campus is one player that has been always been a D two C player and has around thirty seven percent of their revenues coming from online platform. If one were to look at the geographical breakup, North is slightly higher at around thirty percent. And uh, you have your West and South at similar levels, 26-27%. And of course, the smallest contribution is from the East. We'll talk a little bit more about the geographical breakup as and how we look at the listed players. Coming to the urban versus rural mix, uh, your rural is to urban ratio would be 2 is to 1. And a significant part of the industry, of course, is from rural markets, given that most of it is unorganized in nature. Um, in terms of probably your uh, metros or tier ones, around the top eight cities would probably make up around 40% of the rural market. Uh, Relaxo probably has around 60-70% from tier two, tier three cities. So we can understand what the target audience is from that. Um, given that, of course, 75% is open footwear. Bata has a target audience of around, say, 25 to 35 years of age. And if they began targeting metro and tier one cities initially. In the last three to four years, they have been uh, aggressively expanding into uh, towns and cities where the population is below two lakh. Metro, again, is a more uh, premium brand. So it's in your uh, metros and tier one cities. And they are slowly warming up to the idea of increasing their presence in tier three cities, tier two, tier three cities over the last year. This is just like a a, a brand map to get a get better clarity on which brand stands where in the pyramid. So we have our mass segment, which is below five hundred rupees a pair, and that would be brands like Flight, Walkway, Bahamas, etc. Your economy segment, which is up to thousand rupees a pair, would be Paragon, Campus, Bata, to some extent. Uh, you have your mid-segment, where you have Mochi, Metro, Crocs, and uh, that goes up to 3,000 rupees a pair. And you have your premium segment, which is 3,000 rupees above, which would be your Clarks and Hush Puppies. If we were to look at the brands of these listed companies at a glance, Metro has Mochi, Walkway, uh, Metro, which is its signature brand, Da Vinci. Bata has Par, Northstar, Naturalizer. Um, Relaxo has Sparks, Flight. Mirza has Red Tape. Uh, Paragon has Paragon Max, Paralite. So these are their own brands. And if one were to look at their third-party brands, then Metro has uh, a couple of tie-ups with these brands. So they have strategic partnerships with Fitflop, and they have a non-exclusive agreement with Crocs. Uh, recently, they acquired Proline and they entered into an exclusive licensing agreement with Fila from Cravitex. Uh, they expect Fila and Crocs to have the same pace of demand. And what Metro's strategy has been is that instead of uh, creating products in every particular niche, uh, they have tied up with brands that have already made their mark for themselves in that particular sector. So now we'll just take a look at some of the listed players. Uh, just a little bit of context and background on each player before we compare their, uh, probably their KPIs or other metrics. So Relaxo has been set up in 1976 by Ramesh Kumar and Mukund Lal Dua. Uh, it's one of the top non-leather footwear exporters and currently holds around 8% of market share of the organized sector. It's a wholesale-led it's a wholesale -led model with around 93% of revenues coming in from this channel. And they began their retail operations via the franchisee mode in 2004 and 5 for a couple of reasons. So one of them was that they had launched few premium products and uh, distributors would not have the financial muscle to push those forward. They wanted uh, immediate feedback on certain brands and uh, certain product launches. So they thought EBOs was the best way, or the best route to go about it. And 
Thirdly, they wanted to, of course, create brand awareness and showcase the full breadth of their product range in these particular stores. So some of their power brands would be Relaxo, Flight Sparks, like we spoke about. Currently, their main aim would be to increase Sparks to, say, like a thousand crore brand in the next two to three years. Bata is the largest retailer of footwear in India. And if one were to look at their history, Bata, Bata has enjoyed a monopolistic position in the organized footwear sector until the 1980s. And then it started losing market share in the 1990s due to this changing uh, retail landscape and arrival of malls and big retail outlets. So it had a loss-making phase for a couple of years in between. And uh, overall, the company has had its fair share of ups and downs. And then in 2016, they appointed Mr. Sandeep Kataria as the CEO. Uh, who came to Bata India and he played an instrumental role, role in improving the merchandise, in uh, changing the brand perception from just a school shoes brand uh, to a fashion conscious youth oriented brand. Um, and his efforts were suddenly recognized because he was eventually promoted to the global CEO of Bata Shoe Organization. Uh, currently, Mr. Gunjan Shah has taken over as MD and CEO. So, Bata has around 10% market share of the organized, se organized sector. sorry, And um, currently, it probably has one of the widest product ranges because it serves all possible target audiences across all ASPs. Um, so it is mainly, of course, a retail-led business. And most of the revenues are from this channel. Around uh, 40 to 50% yet is from the formal wear segment. So it has several brands. Uh, like we discussed earlier, there's Bata, Hush Puppies, and Par, which contribute a significant amount to their revenues. Par is one of those brands that aims to con compete with international brands because their ASP in uh, the sports segment is around 30-40% lower than these international brands. Coming to Metro, uh, it began in, uh, the company was launched in 1947 in Kulaba in Mumbai and the promoter, Mr. Rafiq Malik is the uh, the promoter and the owner and his daughter, Ms. Farah Malik Banji is the current MD. Uh, Metro is essentially an aspirational brand and uh, it doesn't aim to serve every um, target audience or every ASP. Uh, it's a retail-led business model just like Bata. Uh, what makes it different from some of its other uh, competitors is that Metro has completely outsourced the manufacturing and hence it has an asset light model in this aspect. Um, so Mr. Rakesh Jindranwala, now Mrs. Rekha Jindranwala owns around 17 eight to 17 and a half cents stake in this company. It has a vast brand portfolio and around its in-house brands versus its out outsourced uh, third-party brands would be around 70s to 30. Coming to campus active wear, in 1983, Mr. Hari Krishna Agarwal established a footwear company under the name Action Footwear, which was then eventually launched as Campus. Um, it, it's mainly a sports and athleisure-focused uh, brand, and they've attracted several investors in the past, such as TPG and QRG in 2017. And uh, very recently this year, they forayed into the retail channel as well. So... Um, it addresses around 85% of the market and its target audience is essentially a younger uh, generation of 14 to 35 years of age. So that represents at least less than half of the sports and athleisure market in India. And they have been successfully capturing the market share in this category as they've increased their share from 9 to 15 and eventually now to 17% um, of the sports and athleisure segment within the country. So it has a wide range of products and it's known for its wide range of products. As we saw earlier, it has the highest number of SKUs. And in fact, this is one of the reasons that they've been able to capture the market share um, quite well. And uh, their ability to offer new designs at regular intervals is what has really set them apart. Coming to Paragon, um, it was launched in 1975 with a production capacity of 1,500 pairs per day in Kerala and uh, it's a family-run business um, and uh, the 
uh, there are almost seven cousins and they all jointly manage this uh, company. Most of it is, uh, it's like relax, so it's a wholesale led model. So most of the revenues are from that channel. And some of the markets, key markets it operates in would be Maharashtra, West Bengal, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana. Um, it has a wide product portfolio across PU, Hawaii, EVA based for Pressbook. In that sense, it has a complete product portfolio, but of course, it doesn't have uh, every ESP or every range like, say, a Bata or someone would. They're mainly into open footwear, and they're trying to venture into closed footwear through their brand Eakin to compete with, say, a Sparks or a Walkeroo. And uh, they are trying to enter a high price point based on some recent articles that I read uh, via their EBOs. So we'll have to see how those efforts pan out. Coming to VKC and Wakaru, uh, the group was established in 1984 by uh, venturing into a Hawaii sheet manufacturing unit. Um, eventually, they started their first unit in Kerala to manufacture footwear from PVC. So it's a family-run business again, and uh, they are also mostly into open footwear. So VKC and uh, Paragon are fitting competitors. Wakaru was is a sub-brand of VKC and it was launched in 2012 by Mr. V. Noshad, who is the son of uh, Mr. Mohamed Koya, VKC Mohamed Koya. And uh, Noshad was instrumental in helping VKC launch its PVC and PU-based footwear, which helped them gain the first mover advantage in South India. As far as Wokaru is concerned, their aim was essentially to provide fashionable footwear to the smaller parts and uh, towns of the country. And of course, to compete with Sparks as well. So they currently have around 12 manufacturing units and around 6,000 employees. And they have a country-wide presence of more than 500 deep. Uh, so this is just a snapshot of various KPIs across the board. Uh, we'll start with one company at a time. So if we look at Relaxo, they have around... they've increase their manufacturing capacity from around 7.5 lakh per day to 10 lakh per day in the last three years. And they account for around 11% of India's total manufacturing capacity. Uh, in terms of um, facilities, they have around currently eight facilities and uh, they mainly cater to the north and eastern regions. Um, in terms of retail outlets, they had um, around 389. So their net EBO count has re re remained relatively flat. Um, so as we discussed earlier, also EB EBOs are just a means for them to showcase their premium range of products. So they've more or less kept it flat in terms of retailers and uh, they have around 650,000. And in terms of distributors, what they've been doing is that uh, over the last couple of years, they have brought it down from around 800 to 650 by promising, say, higher volumes uh, for uh, in exchange of higher discounts. So they've been rationalizing their vendor base. Uh, they export mainly to Middle Eastern countries and it counts for around 4 to 5% of their revenues. Coming to Bata, um, so it's in terms of uh, manufacturing, so 50% is in-house and 50% is outsourced. Uh, they have four manufacturing facilities and they're well spread out across the country. They have, uh, since they're retail-led, they have a higher number of uh, retail outlets at around 2,000 uh, EBOs. Uh, and they have around 30,000 uh, in terms of their distribution network. They're not uh, so uh, heavily into exports. And uh, they have a higher employee base uh, because they're more into, of course, uh, your EBO network. So in terms of the stores, around 60, 65% of all the stores are company owned and company operated. They've decided to aggressively pursue the franchisee route in tier two and tier three cities, like I mentioned earlier, and they're making some progress on the same. Um, as we can, yeah. So in contrast to Relaxo, the wholesale channel doesn't contribute so significantly to the top line. Coming to Metro, um, since their entire manufacturing is outsourced, um, in terms of geographical presence, uh, the West and South contribute around 30-35% of revenues each. Um, in terms of retail outlet, outlets, they have around 766. And uh, 
Metro also is not really into um, too much of exports. So, um, yeah, so they're a retail-led model and they plan to add another 200 stores in the coming two years with the proceeds that they've gotten from the IPO. If we take a look at campus, um, around 2.93 crores is their manufacturing capacity per annum. And um, they have around five manufacturing facilities. In terms of geography, they are more predominantly a north-based player. And 50% of revenues are from the north and central regions. Um, if um, So even in terms of manufacturing, uh, most of the manufacturing is outsourced in the sense that 80-85% of the upper is outsourced and around 60-65% of the sole requirements are also outsourced. So they do have some in-house manufacturing. It's not exactly like Metro, but they try to keep it uh, a little minimal. Uh, they've been, they have also given a guidance of around 100 stores annually and they aim to expand via the franchisee model. So they would like to keep the franchisee ratio at around 80%. Company-owned, company-operated stores are mainly just flagship stores. Coming to Paragon, uh, they've decided to scale up their retail presence and uh, from manufacturing around approximately 9 to 11 crores per annum and having more, four manufacturing facilities, um, they currently have around 70 uh, retail outlets, but they aim to increase it to around 150 in the next one to two years. And uh, of course, they're pre more predominantly present in the South and West. Bokaru again has around 13 to 15 crores of manufacturing capacity per annum. Uh, they have several manufacturing units and uh, they are also mainly a South-based player. Their distribution network is very strong. They're a very strongly a distribution-led brand. So it's around 150,000 uh, MBOs, retailers MBOs for them. So coming to some of the footwear players across various ASPs and uh, various uh, segmentation and categories, uh, what we can see is mainly, I'll just highlight the few things. There's a lot of data, so I'll just highlight a few things that are worth looking at. Relaxo essentially targets the mass economy and mid-segment, so their ASPs are uh, certainly less than 15 or 1,000 rupees. And most of the revenue is uh, coming from that segment, as we can see around 72% from casual and 18 from uh, sports and athleisure. Bata's ASPs are less than, uh, are usually more than 1,000, and they constitute for around 50% of your sales, as you can see. Uh, Metro's ASPs are on the higher side, and most of the sales are from the premium segment. So. Their share of revenue coming from the premium segment has gone up from 34% to around 44% in the last uh, four years. So the acquisition of Fila is, uh, will further probably increase their average ASP because the, an average price of Fila is around 2,000 to 5,000 per pair. Campus again has launched price points above 3,000 in 2021. And uh, overall, there's one thing that we can see is that it's a very fragmented market and each player serves a niche segment. If we were to look at some of the financial metrics, uh, before we start, I've added one more company named Aquilite. So I'll just give you a little context. Aquilite is a Delhi-based company and the promoter, Mr. Devinder Gupta, has been in the business uh, since 1984. Uh, they started out with making a traditional farmer's shoe and have evolved to a point where they have a complete product portfolio. They have a current annual capacity of 40 million pairs per annum. So uh, if we look at the revenues, uh, we can see Bata has the highest revenues at almost three and a half thousand crores. And uh, this has increased, uh, one can see mainly on account of increase in ASPs. Volumes have more or less been constant. On the other hand, uh, Relaxo's revenues at our in FY23, around 2,800 crores. But up until FY20 20 or 21, Relaxo 
has been predominantly um, a volume led uh, growth and um, in the last two years even they have had to increase their ASPs due to various increase in raw material prices so um, the volumes to some extent might have taken a hit. So Wakaru and campus have grown quite well and quite quickly especially in the last three years if one sees then campus has had a very significant uh, Kager. So if you see the five-year Kager, campus's Kager is almost 26%. In terms of margins, uh, we have Bata at around your uh, 55 to 57% on an average. Uh, you have Relaxo at around, um, again, 53, 54%. Metro at around 55 to probably almost 60%. And uh, you have campus at around uh, 48 to 50% gross margins. So gross, so they're either dependent on higher ESPs or better cost efficiencies. So Bata and Metro have higher margins due to a function of being present on higher price points. Whereas Relaxo strength has always been in its in-house manufacturing. So if one were to look at pack margins, I think Metro has been in the higher side and especially in the last two years by a margin. Um, the acquisition of Kravitex, however, was worth 200 crores and hence it might be a slightly margin dilutive initially. Uh, Relaxo, on the other hand, has had a hit on margins in the last year as they had to take some corrective measures in terms of pricing. Coming to return on capital employed, uh, barring the pandemic, Bata has consistently had ROCs between, say, 18 and 20 percent. Uh, same for Relaxo. And of course, in FY23, took a hit because of lower profitability. Metro and campus have also had very high um, and sustainable ROCs. So if one were to look at cash flow from operations, Bata's has a, had a higher cash flow from operations versus the other three brands, but uh, Relaxo is probably next in line. So probably around, Bata would be around 500 to 600 crores and Relaxo would probably be around 400 to 500 crores of cash flow from operations. So most of the KPEX uh, that they do is uh, through internal accruals and uh, all of these companies have been um, debt free. If we were just to look at some of the employee expenses as a percentage of sales, Bata's uh, has been the highest. But if you see in FY22, the percentage, as a percentage of sales, it's come down mainly because it's cut down on its employee expenses by only retaining, say, the store manager on the payroll. The rest of the manpower is more flexible in nature. Coming to advertising and promotion, so Relaxo was one of the first to use celebrities in their campaigns to create a brand image for themselves. And of course, others followed suit. Campus has always been very aggressive in terms of marketing spends, and it's currently the highest at around more than 6% uh, of sales. And it's the highest in the industry. And from what I understand, they continue or they intend to continue to uh, keep this going. If we were to look at uh, some of the growth levers versus the key risks in this industry, um, the first would probably be um, increase in consumption. So the spending pattern of the youth is definitely different from those of the older age groups. And I think social media has brought in a lot of awareness and created a lot of an aspirational lifestyle overall that is driving the overall retail and the footwear industry. So this kind of brings us back to the first slide where we spoke about form versus function and how form is being more and more preferred. The aesthetic is becoming more and more important. Uh, coming to increasing participation of women in the workforce. Um, so what it ensures is that there's higher disposable income in the family and especially in the hands of the women, which is also one of the reasons uh, we are seeing that the, the share of women um, in this in the industry is increasing share of revenues from women in the industry is increasing 
at a faster rate. Um, of course, coming to premiumization, which is the largest trend. So uh, several companies, like we saw earlier, Metro Campus stating that their revenues from the premium segment have increased from, say, 30, 33% to around 40, 41% in the last three to five years is a strong indication that uh, higher ASP products are uh, being more well, well accepted, especially in, say, tier ones and tier twos. So um, it's certainly a trend that, in my opinion, is here to stay. Some of the probably key risks or issues that are faced by the industry is, of course, fluctuation in raw material prices. So as we've seen, there's been a lot of fluctuation in RM prices that has led to volatility in margins in the last two, three years. So that is an aspect of the business that the promoters will have to tackle during certain periods with high volatility. Overall, it's a labor-intensive process. So, um, of course, it's always difficult to manage um, a large uh, labor at a larger scale. So that is, again, another issue that the industry might face. And coming finally to the most important drawback would probably be the fact that it's a very fragmented industry with high competition. So most of them have a complete product portfolio, but uh, they stand out in a particular niche segment. So having said that, the competition is tough and it might get more competitive going forward. So companies will have to be more focused on their product portfolio and minimize obsolescence to off stock. So the brand loyalty, honestly, is quite uh, difficult to obtain. And um, you have to be on your toes in terms of your product portfolio if you want to keep the consumer coming back. So a company like Campus has tied up with uh, several Chinese developers who give them real-time data on uh, your retail footwear trends. And they even have around 10 to 15 Chinese uh, full-time employees with them. At, in, at Every year, they launch 300 designs. And at any point, they have 600 designs ready with them. So they have been very aggressive on that front. Coming to valuations. Overall, the entire sector, as we can see, is trading at higher valuations. Um, Bata's EV EBITDA uh, is around 27 times. Um, and over a five-year period, the median is around 32 times. So if one were to compare it to its own median, then it's uh, a little lower in a five-year period. The market cap for Bata, Relaxo, and Metro, Metro are quite similar. Um, Relaxo's mean EV EBITDA over a five-year period would be around 49 times, and its current EV EBITDA is around 61 times. Metro and Campus, which have been recently listed, have also been listed at higher valuation. Over the last one year, uh, Metro has gone up by around 30% in terms of its stock price. And Campus has gone down 36% in the last year due to certain concerns regarding volume growth uh, and volume degrowth rather in the last few quarters. Thank you. Any questions? Hi, Palak. Thank you. Uh, uh, just one, I mean, for every brand which exists, there are 99 brands which don't work. So if you can just highlight qualitatively, if we were to evaluate uh, the the listed companies or whatever brands which you spoke, how would one go about doing that? Are, are consumers sticky to the brands that they wear or own? Uh, how frequently does that change? I mean, what makes a brand stick white? I mean, why is Bata still in existence 40 years of, or all of them have been in existence for 40 years? So why are they still relevant? If in, how to think about, I mean, brand exists today, but 10 years out, if they are still relevant. So that's a very valid point. And I think despite all of them having been in existence, like you said, for so many decades, uh, despite that, neither one of them has been able to really take on a very... Um, serious market share or have a very sticky consumer base because like I mentioned earlier according to me brand loyalty in this particular segment is very difficult to maintain and as and how trends keep changing a consumer is going to go and pick up what they find is the most reasonable for their pocket and is the best to their liking and uh, very often you will see all the brands in a similar area if it's a high street 
and if it's a mall of course they're in the same complex so it makes it very easy for the customer to go and pick and choose um what they like the best so even in terms of probably some global brands stickiness is really not that high and competition is very tough whether you take anta versus leaning or if you take um, in recently even nike and adidas and things like that um so yeah brand stickiness is not there so if one were to qualitatively if you want to uh, really understand what the brand value is then that would be tough so what one can see is that say in relaxo it's not the brand value that it is but uh, it's the the price point and the quality of the footwear that they're giving is what is attracting it and of course it's more of a wholesale led model so that's what works for a company like for example for relaxo thanks yeah hi uh, can you go to that kpi slide of manufacturing give me a sec this one right so i was wondering like in case of bata hmm. how come volume sold is more than the manufacturing capacity like do they you know take it from somebody else as well yeah there? so 50% is in house 50% is outsourced oh okay. all right all right which is why it's almost double okay and in case of metro when they you know outsource it so is it concentrated to like limited suppliers from where they procure or it is like well spread like the diversification is there they have a they have a decent base of exclusive manufacturers who have been there for a very long time thanks uh, thanks for like for the presentation uh even just to your earlier comment if you look at the valuations they are at par with some of the most loyal consumer brands but you feel that you know consumer brand loyalty is not here in footwear so what do you think is driving that is it you know top line growth is it you know rosi and some perspective on some of the global names where they trade at um so <laughs> that's an interesting question in the retail sector in general um the entire sector if one were to see is quite overvalued and according to me it would be probably more of a na- macro narrative that is driving these kind of valuations yeah so with this uh, bis implementing do you think uh, there will be any supply chain disruptions huh. uh, so with this bis implementation do you think any of this company will face any supply chain disruption um maybe to some extent but i don't know how severely the listed or the really big players will face it because the volumes that they would be giving to their uh, if they are outsourcing it then the volumes that they would be giving would be fairly large i think it is the unorganized sector uh which is trying to manufacture to some extent and is not totally import dependent which will get most affected Thanks Palak. Thank you. When our things got rough. I always remember what my father used to say. Running a business does test a man my son. There are ups and downs. Glorious highs and sometimes a low that leaves you feeling defeated. the character of a man and the character of a business are not very different are they yes but when the chips are down we must stand up dust ourselves off and more wrong volatility it's a funny thing it makes you question yourself and wonder if you've made all the right decisions sure you can question some of your decisions but stay steadfast on your goals dad always said there are no shortcuts and no quick profits there are no free lunches are there there is only one right way at ppfs we think like rahul and his father that volatility is a fact of running a business and buying equity shares is like owning a part of that business we use value investing principles to manage your money this means we invest in the right businesses 
at reasonable prices and for a longer term. PPFAS Mutual Fund. There's only one right way. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.